dreams Get your cream by any means And being with self-esteem Beauty supreme and booty walk so mean The way you fit in them jeans You eat your cornbread and greens Dance or a doctor Red wine or vodka Redesign your spot and redefine your mantra Retwist your locks and realign your chakras Doing your squats and getting closer to God, huh? Brunching with your squad or taking a girl's trip Adjust your crown You guys give to the world, sis Celestial body Drink your water Meditate Sun kiss got his heavenly order Levitate Tribe of Ashanti Black girl magic Melanin popping Whether you ratchet or lavish Whether you bougie or savage You a gift and a treasure You got to love a black girl Getting a shift together Black girls are getting a shift together These black girls getting a shift together Man, these black girls are getting a shift together These black girls getting a shift together, dog. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Black Girls Getting Their Shift Together. I'm a Black girl that's constantly trying to get her shift together, and I hope you all join me along with this ride as well. But each week, I have podcasts and some wonderful guests, and each week, I try to deliver the most relevant topics that can help us get our shift together. Tonight, we're going to have a wonderful guest. She's a repeat guest. But before we get into that, make sure, please, go to all social media, follow Black Girls Getting Their Shift Together, as well as BlackGirlsGettingTheirShiftTogether.com. And whenever you listen to me on an audio podcast, make sure and give your girls some five-star reviews. (laughs) They're nice. I've been reading them and I'm so grateful. I really am. All right. We're going to get right into tonight's topic. Tonight's topic is fatherless daughters. So I'm going to bring my wonderful lock sister. Y'all, when I bring her on, look at her locks. They are popping. They are beautiful. And she is too. And she has a very wonderful spirit. Hello, Bernadette. Hi, Ursula. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you for saying yes and coming on again. Thank you for inviting me again. The last time was super fun. So I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation too. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So before we get into it, I just want everyone to know who who I'm talking to. All right. This is Bernadette Jackson. She is the CEO and lead strategist at Her Consulting Group. She creates resources for fatherless daughters to learn how to process their father wounds so that they can begin to authentically experience the amazing relationships that they deserve. She is also the creator and host of Healing Elevates Relationships podcast, where she defines how the world views women with daddy issues. Deep breath, Ursula. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Woo! Before we get into that, I really love your voice on your snippets that you mm-hmm. have on Instagram from your podcast. Very calming. Thank you. Very calming and inviting. Yeah, it's very welcoming. What does her stand for? It actually stands for Healing Elevates Relationships. Mm. Mm-hmm. How did you come up with that name? It was a lot of reflection, honestly, because I knew that as I was on my healing journey, I wanted to have different relationships. I wanted to have better relationships. And I realized that after I had um, gone through some healing and I had changed my mind about some things, I had started to look at myself differently. I realized that the quality of my relationships Mm -hmm. had improved. And so it just came to me one day that healing does, in fact, elevate relationships. And because it was, you know, the HER acronym and I speak to HER, um, it just felt like it was alignment. So I went with it. Yes, that it, <laughs> that's alignment in, in its best. It is funny when, when you start to, a person starts to heal the clarity The glass, the lens literally clears up and you're right. And relationships improve. And sometimes they relationships improve because some relationships that no longer serve us fall off. 
Yes, yes. And I'm glad that you said that too, because one of the things that I learned about um, relationships is that not all of them are meant to be lifelong. And sometimes the bond that we have with people is because we have shared trauma and not necessarily because this person is supposed to walk with us through life. And so part of my healing journey has been the um, the concept of soft goodbyes. And it's where I realize that a person is not meant to be in my life any longer. And instead of it being dramatic and hard and um, difficult, I thank them for the part of the journey that they played. And I wish them well. Because with them leaving my life, it gives me more room and more capacity to welcome the people who are aligned to me and who I'm supposed to be in a relationship with. And so mm -hmm. it's just, it's a process that I think doesn't need to be as hard as we make it. And, you know, I mean, I'm just at a point in my life where honestly, I, I don't want for things to be as difficult as they used to be. I don't really want to catastrophize every ending, you know, um, mm. every small thing that happens anymore. So it really has been a game changer for me to just, you know, like release people gently. And it, it makes my heart feel to feel good that, you know, we spent some time together, our time is done. And now, you know, you're free to find your people and I'm free to find mine versus, you know, I wasted my time here and what was I thinking and all of these other things that makes it so hard for us to, you know, open ourselves up to new opportunities. So it's, mm. you know, it's been a process, but I, I, I really like where things are going. I love when you said a soft goodbye and the catastrophe of an ending relationship. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm going to borrow that. Well, it hits my soul because growing up with so much experiencing so much trauma that I didn't realize it because we normalize dysfunction so mm -hmm. much. I didn't realize that some most relationships ended and it wouldn't be a soft goodbye. It would literally be Armageddon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's Armageddon and it's heartbreak and it's, you know, like for longing and it's, you know, let's see if we can work it out again. And it's just, it's a lot of times it's just too much, too much. Yeah. And I feel like deep down, we realize that a lot of these relationships are expired and we're holding on to them because it's what we know and not necessarily because it's what's good for us or what we deserve. Mm. And it's like, you know, that kind of thing is really what I want us as fatherless daughters to really think about, you know, like the relationships that you have now, how are they elevating your life? What is happening there that's making you feel like you can operate in your best self? You know what I mean? Like just taking some inventory of what these relationships make you feel about right. yourself, about your environment, about the other person. And some of it would really be so telling to, to let you know, like, hey, this may not be where I should be right now. You know what I mean? Like this mm -hmm. actually isn't serving me the way I thought that it was. And when we can start to be real about some of these things, I think that we can then get to the root of why are we in the types of relationships where we don't feel seen, we don't feel supported or loved wow. or safe. You know what I mean? And why do we, why are we trying to like fight so hard to stay in these relationships that we have absolutely no business in? So it 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 on it, it it's a rabbit hole. But be honest with you, like one that I went through and, you know, coming out on the other side has left me with these kinds of questions. And it's it's really what I ask other people when we're talking about things like this, like, you know, how is this really serving you? Right. What are your thoughts about it and things of that nature? Because sometimes we don't even think about those things anymore. No. We're so used to being there that it's like, this is just the norm. And exactly. The normalized dysfunction. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. It's that toxic loop. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> it really is. It, it really is. At least, yeah. From 
my experience and listening to other experiences, it's definitely a toxic loop. Mm -hmm. Have you ever found that some of your clients, maybe subconsciously, they can't see that it's, the relationship isn't good for them and that they push the, the finish line further back? Does that make sense? I do. Yeah, it makes sense what you're saying. And yes, um, most of my clients have had relationships with people where they weren't able to see why they shouldn't be there. Um, it was a level of comfort that they felt in that kind of dysfunction. And I feel like that is something that needs to be highlighted because Ooh. when when we have grown up in a certain level of dysfunction, mm -hmm. that feels normal for us. Mm -hmm. And so whatever feels normal for us is something that we don't question. And even though we know that we want more, we yearn for more. Like we're dying to be truly seen and loved correctly for us. Right. We're still going to stay in relationships that feel normal, even though they're dysfunctional and even though they're not giving us what we need, because we are used to operating in that dysfunction. We understand what the outcome is going to be, and we can mm -hmm. even accept that this may not work, but it's going to be okay for now. For now, a lot yes. of us, a lot of us are okay with you know the situation for now, and don't want to do the hard work or the heart work of getting to the real benefit, which is somebody truly seeing who you are, loving you for who you are, and making you feel safe and partnering with you in the type of relationship that you actually want. Ooh. And, uh, you know, I talked about this in my podcast, it, uh, the episode aired on Tuesday about um, instant gratification. And one of the things that instant gratification talks about is the fact that, you know, people have a tendency to want the, the lesser but immediate benefit now instead of the benefit that's going to be more long lasting and much more substantial in the future. And I feel like a lot of fatherless daughters would prefer to have the the instant gratification now because it's something that we can quantify. We can trust something that's coming now, but we can't trust anything that's going to be promised in the future for a number of reasons. Number one, we have abandonment issues. OK, people don't stay. People leave. And so when we think about that kind of stuff, it's really hard for us to conceptualize and accept that we're going to do a thing and get a benefit far in the future, even though it might be promised to be exactly what we want. We need to see that thing now. And as survivors of trauma, being in survival mode all the time, like your brain is only ever equipped to deal with what's right in front of you. And right. what's right in front of you is the dysfunction. And it can it can handle that. I'm going to take one small step here, there, or, or wherever, but I can't think about what's two, three miles down the road. You know what I mean? So a lot of us will do what has always been done. We will do what we know we can succeed at. We will do what we know we, we can get instant um, validation for and what comes easy to us. And a lot of that does cycle around dysfunction. A lot of it does cycle around expired relationships or doing just enough to get by and all of these things where we want more, but we don't know how to get it. And we don't know if we feel like it's worth it to actually mm. work to get it. You know, like it's- Yes, that is so true. It is a lot. As you're speaking, these are almost oxymorons i'm thinking of mindful dysfunction mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> right because you're, you're right yeah. yeah you're not thinking how you could have a substantial uh gratifying like a true soulful gratifying relationship where you can be authentic right and, and receive and to give love so we'll stay right here in the present in the mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. even though it, it is horrible and it literally destroys our soul. Yeah. But we know that's that high function anxiety because if we stay in the present, we know what's going to happen. Yes. Yes. And when you know what's going to happen, you feel like you have some control over your environment. And when you feel like you have some control over your environment, you feel a little bit more safe. 
And so that in and of itself, although it's not where you want to be, it does kind of stamp down the anxiety a little bit because we know that anxiety is heightened by the unknown. So it's just this cycle, you know? Oh my God. I'm already triggered. I was <laughs> triggered two minutes in, but you know, I've been doing the hard work mm -hmm. so I can recognize it, but I'm blessed to be in a circle knowing people like yourself because- yes. Oh yeah, because it, it's it's triggering, but it's healing. Very much so. Very much mm -hmm. so. And I love what you said about expired relationships, because it's just like drinking some spoiled milk. Mm -hmm. You know, you, mm -hmm. you know what it's going to taste like, but mm -hmm. you're still gonna drink. It, you know, and I'm saying this because I am a card member uh, what is it a member card caring member of yeah. drinking the spoiled milk and I, I know girl yeah I can raise my hand too because you know what it is I was just thinking about it when you gave that analogy it's not so much that the milk is curdled it's just like maybe two or three days past the expiration date you know what I mean and it's mm -hmm. like it has that tent that that taste where you know it's gone off but it's not bad enough where it's like oh I can't take it so it looks like, like this. You smell it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's like, you know what? Like, this isn't so off that I can't really sit in this. And like, I'm, a, I'm okay. You know what? My coffee is hot. Like, I think I could do it. You know what I mean? It's like that. It's like, it's not curdled, but you know, it's off. And you just almost build up an acquired taste for the expiration of it all. And it's yeah. like, mm, okay. And it's like, the more you do that, the more the acquired taste is stronger and stronger. And you're able to withstand more of the fact that this milk or this relationship is getting further and further past the expiration date. Yes. So you don't even, you don't even taste it anymore to you. Now that's normal. And that's where the problem is. Exactly. And you know, it goes from the, like you said, may not be curdled, but then even if it is curdled, just the, well, it's just one, mm -hmm. I'll pick it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's get back mm -hmm. to the tainted. And then one curdle turns into 25. And before you know, we have yogurt and we're yes. going to put granolas in. We're going to yes. zhuzh it up yes. Yes. and make it quote yes. unquote, right. 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 Woo. I'm speaking from experience. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> so I get it. And anyone listening in the podcast or during this live stream, drop some comments in the thread and let me know, or you can always message me on the message board and give your thoughts. So uh, Bernadette, I'm going to put this graphic up. Mm. So for those on the podcast, this graphic says you may have a father wound if, and then there's a series. We can go over each of them or some of them, but why don't you pick one that speaks to you and then I'll go next. Okay. Um, I like, you have to act as a parent to your father. Oh. Oh, you know what? I like that one, but I think I like this one more. You have to excessively try to earn your worth. I like that even better. Mm, talk to me. Yeah, I really like that one because I think it speaks to the ways in which fatherless daughters um, typically try to to prove their worth. And a lot of it is overextending themselves in relationships, um, not prioritizing their needs and desires. Um, staying quiet about things that they really want to speak up about, especially when it's something that is creating inner turmoil for them or not wanting to have a conflict with somebody. So they would prefer to, to not say what's on their heart. Things of that nature, I feel really lend itself to, to that particular description about wanting to prove your worth and constantly doing and trying to be, and even if it's wearing a mask because you wanna belong, you know, mm -hmm. or um, 
being on this achievement train where you're constantly trying to achieve um, this goal after this goal after this goal, hoping that you're going to get the kind of validation that's long lasting Mm -hmm. and outside validation is really just good for the moment. And then it passes. But the kind of validation that you need comes from yourself. It comes from you understanding that you have worth regardless of who decided not to stay and who decided to leave. Mm. And the fact that you draw breath means that your value is already concrete. Right. So as a result of that, when we don't understand that our, our value and our sense of worth has to come from within, we do things to get it from the people around us, the people who, who we want to love us, the people mm-hmm. who want to stay. And sometimes that may look like creating an environment where you want to be all things to everyone. And because if you can make sure that you're the type of person who is always there to give somebody exactly what they need the moment they need it, Mm -hmm. you feel safe that they will never leave you because somebody who is needed doesn't get left behind. And so you always create opportunities like that for yourself. And uh, it, it really is just a abandoning of who you truly are. Because yes. The wearing of the mask is, is self-abandonment. If you can't show up authentically as exactly who you are, then not only is no one going to be able to love you for you, because you're only showing a version of yourself, the version of yourself that you think will belong in whatever particular group that it is that you're trying to belong to. But also it is saying subconsciously that who you are to your core isn't enough. And when you say that to yourself by acting in these ways, it is solidified by so many other things around you. And then you become a person who doesn't even recognize yourself anymore. Mm. And you become a person who is so attached to labels or a particular person or group that if that group or that person has ever left or you now don't have access to it anymore, you, you're looking in the mirror wondering, well, what am I doing now? What do I have now? And right. all of that is super dangerous. It is when you said how um, you're in these toxic relationships and you you don't recognize yourself and you ever hear the terms when when women, when we say I just lost myself. Yes, that's exactly Mm -hmm. what that is. Mm -hmm. And when the relationship's over, you're like, what the hell just happened? Right. And you and then there's nothing to show for. Actually, I take that back. There's heartache, grief. <laughs> I take that back. There is something to show for it, but <laughs> you you think about all the work you put into it, mm-hmm. and this is what you have at the outcome. It's and hard. It is, and that's also a genesis. One of the genesis of people pleasing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. anticipating the needs. It's a lot. It is a lot. You know, oh my God. Okay, I'm going to pick one. This one spoke to me. Let's see. Um, He refuses to repair your relationship after conflict. Mm. I know. And in my mother's country, Mm -hmm. we call that being wrong. Oh, well, you get it because you're from the islands too. Mm -hmm. Being wrong and strong. Yep. Yeah. By any means necessary. Definitely. I definitely get that. That ego is no joke. It really isn't. It really isn't. It's I I find that it's it's even more detrimental when you don't understand how it affects the people around you. Mm -hmm. I used to um date a guy who his ego was huge. Okay. He had what you call that big D energy. And it was just like, it was always taking up space in the room, always taking up space in the room. So <laughs> I can go so far with that, but <laughs> I've got so many questions. <laughs> Took a lot of space, huh? <laughs> he just apologizing was something that he would never do. He thought so strongly that whatever he said 
And whatever came out of his mouth is exactly what he meant to say, exactly how he meant to say it. So he just never walked back any statements, regardless of how it may have um, really hurt the person or how it came off or whatever it is. It was it was so crazy, so crazy. And me, in my unhealed self, thought that it was like the sexiest thing. Imagine that. Like, oh, yeah. he's so strong. He's so... I love his control. And it's like, really? Yeah. It, it, it was so interesting, honestly, when I think about it now, how that relationship showed me so much of what I thought about myself in terms of staying someplace where I knew that I was not loved. And I mm -hmm. decided that I was going to challenge myself to prove that I was worthy to be loved at any opportunity that I could find. Yeah, being that ride or die chance. Yes, yes. And just doing whatever was asked of me, trying to anticipate needs. All the while, you know, things would be done. And after conflict, he would give me the silent treatment or, you know, he would do any number of other really hurtful things. And I was over here like sick to my stomach trying to figure out, well, how am I going to um, right the ship again? When right. I and he tipped about it over. Exactly. And it's it's crazy the amount of things that women will do just to be able to say that I have a man when the relationship is not one even worth mentioning and it doesn't make you feel good and you're not showing up as your best self and you don't feel loved, safe or supported. So what would even be the point? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it, it's hard. Mm. I want to touch on the unsafe part that because there's another graphic that's in there. I definitely want to unpeel that for sure. Okay. Um, no, I don't want to do that one. Okay. What else do you see on this infographic? And again, for those just joining this infographic says you may have a father wound if and I think we should talk about there is a desire to be seen as strong and never weak. Ooh, that Ooh, one. Let's that get one. into it. Yeah. That <laughs> one right there, that you have the desire to be seen as strong and never weak. I feel like that really just lends itself to how we feel about vulnerability. And the fact that vulnerability for us is something that's almost akin to death, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like I could never be vulnerable to a person because then they're going to know where I hurt. They will know like what my flaws are. They'll know that I'm not superhuman and I'm not actually superwoman and all of these things. And whenever, you know, we, we actually lay ourselves bare like that, we give people ammunition to hurt us. Mm. And because we have been hurt by our father in so many different ways, that's the one thing that we said was never going to happen again. I'm going to create a steel wall around my heart so yes. that nobody could ever penetrate enough to hurt me as deeply as my father has or my father figure has. Ooh. And when we do that, we do say things like, well, nobody's ever going to get close. I'm only going to let a person get but so far with me. And then that's it. You know, somebody's going to have to prove themselves over and over and over again before I even give them an inch. And it also means that we don't let anyone see us cry. We don't let anyone know that what they may have done hurt us. We don't ask for help. We don't mm -hmm. ever show up as being someone who doesn't know something because all of these different things mean that we are not perfect and that we have flaws. Mm -hmm. And the threat of us not feeling perfect in our eyes and having flaws and needing help and, and being soft and crying and all of these things means that somebody could leave that they may not want to see us this week. And so if they see us this week, they may not like it and they may decide that they don't wanna stay. 
that it's not worth it and things of that nature. And mm-hmm. so we have decided instead that we are going to try to be superwoman. We're going to try to do everything ourselves. We're going to try and show up as perfectly as we can, as knowing it all, as never needing any help and all of the things, because it makes us feel like we have value. Exactly. And that is how we feel most val- validated and most worthy. Mm, yeah, that's again a genesis of super black woman complex. Yeah. Right yeah. there. And when you said that about the steel curtain, that wall that no one can penetrate, but then we still will want someone to be authentic with us, but we're of not course. willing to give that out. Of course. And you know what the funny thing is, is that as the steel wall is up, I mean, as you have it erected so high that people can't even like get over to the other side, you really are begging and hoping and pleading that they will want to take the journey to climb up over that slippery steel wall to get to the other side to where your soft heart is. You really want somebody over there on the other side with you, but you don't want to put the wall down. You don't want to actually tell somebody how you feel. You don't want to do anything that could mean that you're going to be weak. But deep down, you want to be seen, loved, and supported for Mm -hmm. you. And that is going to require a level of vulnerability that you don't want to share. So it's it's a catch-22. It is. I learned from my shadow work coach about avoidant dismissive Hmm. attachment. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what that sounds like right there. Yeah, absolutely. Like I want the love, but I'm not going to let you love me. Right. Right. Please love me. No, not that way. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I find that a lot of fatherless daughters are either avoidant attached or Mm -hmm. anxiously attached. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And it's funny you said that because Sarita, if you're watching, hello, mm-hmm. Sarita Yvonne, she was on my uh, my pod last month or so. And when I took the test, the attachment test, I had scored with anxious attachment. Well, before therapy, mm-hmm. you know, I'm healing, I'm continuing to heal. But until I had her on the show, I didn't realize that at times, it, I thought it was strictly linear. I didn't mm-hmm. know it was as fluid. Mm-hmm. Talking, and I'm thinking, ooh, that was me as well with the yeah. avoidant because I wore, I wore the steel wall like a badge of honor. Mm-hmm. I thought that was my superpower at a point. Yeah, oh, I was. I got so good at. Um, creating an atmosphere where people felt comfortable to share with me without me ever saying anything to them. I mean, I got really good at that. I mean, and (laughs) it's funny now because now I have to, I have to consciously um, like open up to people because it's just, it's not even in my nature. I have lived so long as a person who's always been like the keeper of secrets or the, the person who, is um, the person that everyone comes to for advice. I've always been that person. And uh, I never felt like if you're always coming to me for advice, I can't like turn around and be like, oh, hey, here's my problem and stuff like that. It just felt super weird to me. So I have gotten used to being the person that everyone comes to and never having anyone to go to, to really like, you know, with, you know what I mean? Wow. So it, that 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 was new for me. Having people in my life that I can do that with was was new because it, for a very very long time there was nobody that I could really do that with. And don't you see how that could build up our power pack of the mm-hmm. superwoman? Like our cape is getting longer and stronger. Yeah. yeah. And I I am the keeper. I can do anything and every come to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's true. Oh my God. So I'm going to read a comment. Hey, blind guy, his wife in their life. She says she's listening and driving and she heard big D energy. And she said big dynamic energy can be interesting. (laughs) It sure can. It very much can. It can. All right. I'm going to go over one more 
infographic before we go into the other infographic. All right, so let me enlarge this. Mm, uh, unable to turn to your father for support. Mm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he lacks interest in your life. Oh, yeah, let's do that one. I picked that one. Really, mm-hmm. all of them on this list. Right. But he lacks interest in your life and is not present. Mm. And when I read that, that goes back to a genesis of being a people pleaser. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't, if he's not interested, what else can I do? Yeah. The top said activity or um, whoever I would meet. Mm-hmm. Now that I think about it, and sometimes being in competition. That's so true. That's so true. Honestly, um, that re- that really reminds me of some of the symptoms of when a father is present but not emotionally available, mm-hmm. and uh, um, the the daughter ends up needing attention, good or bad, from whoever will give it to her. Yeah, and so she she does whatever she needs to do to get her needs met and to to feel like you know somebody's paying attention. And a lot of it can be really, really detrimental because some of the things that she may be willing to do is hurtful to herself, is making her feel even worse about herself. But it's almost this compulsion to do whatever she can because she wants somebody to look at her, to pay attention to her. You know, like it's just like you silently crying out with these actions. Hey, I'm here. You know, look at me, pay attention to me, hug me, love me, love me and yeah. whatnot. And we'll just do whatever to feel those feelings, you know? Absolutely. And you can't sex them good enough. You can't <laughs> buy them goods. Items is never going to be good enough. Right. It's going to be endless. I don't care how much you cook with the kind words. It's just, it's never going to be good enough. Exactly. And it's coming from a manipulative place as well. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I don't think a lot of times that people even realize that it is coming from a manipulative place. Some of them really just, they want to be loved so badly that it's Mm -hmm. like, well, what can I do today? How can I, how can I prove myself today and whatnot? But you're right. It's definitely a form of manipulation. It is because you're not presenting yourself as your authentic self with your true needs and wants. So I'm going to paint this picture with this mask and you're going to love that version of me. But Mm -hmm. that's not the real version. Right. Okay. So you touched on a lot of these topics. And how it may present, not may, how it will present itself. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to read some of them off. Oh, before I do that, uh, I found this out in therapy that I never thought I had a father wound because I had a full-time parent in the house. Mm -hmm. I had a two-family household. And I knew I was safe because I had shelter, Mm -hmm. food. I went to dancing school, private Mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. It looked good on paper. Right. But the emotional absence, I was like, damn. And I told my therapist, I said, I think I'm a fatherless daughter as well. Mm -hmm. She just looked at me like you just did. Like you just now finding out right. to you, but you, you figured it out. <laughs> right. I find it honestly, like when I speak to some people about what their experience has been with their fathers, yes. I don't ever, I don't ever want to be the person that's like, Hey, you know that you're a fatherless daughter, right? Like I prefer for people to come to that on their own. But sometimes when people talk about what their experience has been, I'm like, wow, they don't even really realize that a lot of the relationship issues that they're having stems from the fact that their father was not present 
emotionally for them. And that, you know, this person was physically there, but there really wasn't anything that they were doing to solidify a lasting relationship with their daughter so that they could understand the, like, what that dynamic is supposed to be like. Mm-hmm. So it's it's funny that you said that, but but there's there's a lot of people who have that experience and they have not yet come to the truth yet. No. So they're still wondering what's going on with them. Why can't they have a lasting relationship? Why am I always picking the wrong men or whatever it is? And it's like, baby girl, you got some work that you got to do. Exactly. (laughs) Again, that toxic loop, the normalized dysfunction, it's it's all the same. And I did a live before we went on and Mm -hmm. I had mentioned how a lot of us navigate in the relationships and I'm coming talking from experience, <laughs> but we navigate subconsciously wanting that attention or the love mm-hmm. or what whatever all these things that we're talking about now. And just like you said, we don't recognize it. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you will never recognize right. it. Right. So we have a comment, blind guy and his wife said the attention seeking is so often misunderstood and not explored for healing. That is very, very true. That's yes. very true. And it really it, yeah, like the fact that it's misunderstood, I think is really even key there because a lot of people think like, oh, this person is just so annoying. You know, they want to be, they want to always be the center of attention, but there's something behind that, that we don't ever really explore. So mm-hmm. I completely agree with that. Exactly. Now we can go on to the infographic. All right. So let me read some, and this is how it can present itself low self-esteem, feeling not good enough, weak, rigid boundaries, self-critical, not feeling safe in your body, Mm. feelings of anger and rage towards men, pulling others along. Let's put a pin in that one because I didn't understand what that meant. Need to prove your worth, resistance to discipline, structure, distrust, lost faith in the masculine, chasing the external representation of masculine energy, attracted to, oof, triggered, attracted (laughs) to emotionally unavailable partners. And I'll leave the last two as a nice present. (laughs) (laughs) What stands out to you, sis? Mm, uh, Weak or rigid boundaries. um, Really? First, yeah. Yeah. Um, The reason why it stood out to me is because I realized that um, a lot of survivors of trauma, especially fatherless daughters, have very, very weak boundaries. Mm -hmm. Um, And if we're if we're going to talk about it in its totality, there definitely is a spectrum where it's like either it's rigid or it is weak. And with the rigid boundaries, I think that some boundaries are definitely rigid where fatherless daughters are concerned. And those are the ones that surround rejection and abandonment. Like Mm -hmm. for instance, you're not ever going to accept a person cheating on you. However, you will accept for someone to like, you know, not really give you what you want, even though they're there. You know what I mean? Physically. Right. And it's like, so, so <laughs> there's certain things that we are, will be very, very rigid about in terms of, you know, this has to be this particular way or no way at all. But I find that a lot of boundaries are really weak. And a lot of it has to do with not wanting to rock the boat not wanting to do something mm-hmm. that might scare a person off. If, you're, if your boundaries are too rigid, if all of them are ones that a person has to like, you know, um, what's the word? If they have to maybe work for, then it's like, are they going to feel like you're worthy enough to do the work? And that mm. is a question that I feel like a lot of fatherless daughters ask themselves subconsciously. And I feel like they feel subconsciously that they're not worth the work 
that is required when they have boundaries in place, especially healthy ones. And so because they don't want to have somebody answer the question in the negative, and make them feel even worse about themselves, especially since a lot of fatherless daughters seek validation outside of themselves, then the boundaries being weak is almost a guarantee that the person is much more likely to stay. Stay, yes. And that is where, you know, that whole conundrum happens, if you will. It's the golden pass. They will be there you know, for sure. Mm -hmm. You laid everything out. Right. Right. It's, it's not hard for you. So I was talking to my girlfriend about this the other day where, um, I used to be a woman that prided myself on the fact that all of my ex-boyfriends always wanted to come back, you know, like there was never an ex-boyfriend that I have had that has not called me up six months, a year, two years, whatever down the road. Like I miss you. I want to come back. I don't know why I did what I did, whatever it was. And uh, one day I was on a walk and the Lord just downloaded into my spirit that you understand that the reason why they wanted to come back is because you don't make it hard for them. There is no boundary that you have in place that they have to aspire to. There is nothing that they have to do to earn your trust again. And it was like, people are always want to go, are always going to want to go back to something that's easy to get. And when he downloaded that into my spirit, I was like, Jesus, like, goodness. I know. (laughs) I used to do the same thing. Like, girl, he yeah, my house at 10 o'clock at night. Uh He was throwing little pebbles to wake me up. Meanwhile, my ego is just right. expanding. Right. I'm just you feel everything the, to you this. You're feeling the validation, like, you know, it's stroking your ego and all of that. Meanwhile, it's like this person is like, I got everything that I needed here. There was never any work that I had to do. Like, they bent over backwards to make sure that I felt seen and secure. I didn't have to do anything. Why wouldn't they want to come back? It's an easy gig for them. It is. It's like going back to an old shoe. You know how it's going to fit. You know where the holes are. So you know how to adjust your feet accordingly. And then you just go on your nice walk and life is good. (laughs) I just thank God for healing, honestly. Yes. You can like, you know, just start to see things better. And it's really that that really is the genesis of healing elevates relationships. That's exactly Mm -hmm. what I mean by that, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. you you get to see the things that you were doing before and you get to understand them on a different level. And now you can make a choice to do something differently. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and get of out of that too. toxic loop. Exactly. Exactly. And now when you see yourself going back into some of these old patterns, you don't stay there uh, that as long as you did before because it becomes very uncomfortable. It's almost as if like as soon as your mind is open to like, you know, what you actually wanted and you start to experience that thing, anything less than that is like this doesn't feel right anymore. It doesn't fit anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, you begin to, you know, like very quickly realize like, oh, okay, this is not the space for me. I need to exit because this is not what it used to be. It's not fitting the way it used to fit, you know? Right. You always have to listen to your body. Mm. You can ignore it, but your body will send triggers. Right. Your soul sends triggers and we won't ignore it. As long, like you said, Mm -hmm. your soul won't let it settle. It will not. No. It will not. Mm -mm. It won't. So I definitely understand the weak boundaries. Uh, In addition to the firm, what are your thoughts on the firm, rigid boundaries slash controlling? Mm. Yeah, honestly, I think that that's also a thing. Um, I feel like... um, Fatherless daughters operate a lot in extremes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the extreme of the weak boundaries is one side that we talked about. But, you know, there definitely is the other side with the rigid boundaries bordering on control because uh, control makes us feel safe. 
anything that we can control, we feel like we can predict the outcome of. And Mm -hmm. excuse me, anything that we can predict the outcome of, we know exactly how to respond to it. And if we know how to respond to something, then we understand exactly what our role in that thing is. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself makes us feel safe when we suffer with the fear of abandonment. So a lot of that is really connected. Um, And it, it, it does come from the root of not wanting to be abandoned. And so let me try and control every single possible thing that I can, because feeling like you can control something, you feel like you can get it to stay longer or, or whatever it is. But what I've noticed is that the the boundaries that are erected, because a lot of them are so rigid and so controlling, it pushes people away. And we don't understand that that's what's really happening. And mm-hmm. so we're feeling like people are slipping through our fingers and we're trying to hold on a little bit tighter. We're trying to, mm-hmm. you know, like <laughs> control the situation more when the person is trying to get away because it can be suffocating some of the things that we're asking for or what we expect to happen that is normal you know what i mean so right it's almost like you can feel the cracks getting right the the craze marks are expanding and the more you hold on to it it's crumbling and Mm -hmm. it's that's definitely an unsafe feeling It, it activates that abandonment yeah absolutely absolutely what about that term on there that said pull others along I didn't understand that. I'm trying to I'm trying to understand like what that means as well. Yeah. Um pulling others along. Let me pull it I up think here. I feel like that probably is um oh, okay, you know, maybe we could use this as an analogy. A lot of us will hear a person say that they don't want to be in a serious relationship, but take that as a challenge to prove that, you know, I can be the difference maker. And so a lot of times I think that maybe... um, whenever we are in a relationship with a person and the person is not, they haven't like made their intentions known. So we are just trying to dictate the pace of the relationship by like pulling them along into things. Um, You know, I I think that we've been together for a year now, we should probably make this official or, you know, Mm -hmm. like I I think that we've been, we've, we've been dating now for two years now, we should probably get engaged and things like that. And there's some men that will go along with that because for them it's, you know, they're getting whatever they want in the relationship. Right. Anything that they have to really do. And so if it means that making you happy is, you know, like acquiescing to some request that you have to solidify the relationship for the outside world in a way that makes you feel more secure or more validated, Mm. then a lot of people will do that just to appease you because they don't want that good thing that they have going on to be taken away from them. And so right. it, it's not a, it's not something that is um, hard for them to do. I think that's the way I'm looking at it. Right. That, I like that. I like that. It, and it makes sense to me. What stood out to me here is being attracted to unemotionally available partners. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. a huge, huge one yeah. from my experience. The different different men but same experience Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. same outcome yeah yeah i completely agree um i talk about that a lot on my platform um on Mm. ig and in the podcast about unavailable men and the fact that a lot of us are used to that and it's because uh, our father was unavailable And if we had a father that was unavailable and we maybe didn't see our mom in a healthy relationship that showed the kind of um, male female dynamic that would have taught us what to look for, then emotional unavailability is the norm. And we talked earlier about the fact that the norm is something that we don't question. Whether we want it or not, even if we crave more, we don't really question things that are normal for us. It just is. And things that happen to, to be or to look like you know, um, what we've seen before um, are things that we're used to experiencing and we right. know how to handle. And so because we know how to handle them, 
it's just what naturally gravitates to us. And so when we see anything that looks like that, even if it's in a different package, it's like, okay, yeah, that, that's what it is that I want. Meanwhile, your heart is yearning for more and you don't know how to get it and you don't know what's what's wrong really until you start the healing process and you're exposed to different and more. Yes. And it's that exposure to different and more that ends up being what allows you to start accepting more aligned relationships with the kind of people that can really see you and make you feel safe and with whom you can have the kinds of relationships that you really yearned for. Exactly. Oh, I love that, Bernadette. Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> it's funny. I've told this story before when I had a, a not a good breakup. It was not good. And the relationship was, it was trash at the end. Well, in the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> let me keep it real, but it was trash. So I said, I'm going to talk to a counselor. And Initially, I'm thinking it's a, about this individual and how I'm feeling, but little did I know the genesis of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And it ended and up being about you, right? Say that again. I said, and it ended up being about you, right? Yes. <laughs> My therapist said, you know, we've been talking. I, I don't know. I'm just going to throw that number. Mm -hmm. Three months. I don't know. And she's like, you haven't mentioned said person. I was like, F him, I don't, fuck him. I don't care about, I'm, I'm figuring things about myself. And mm -hmm. I realized it had nothing to do with him mm -hmm. at all. He was just another member of the choir. That's right. all. It right. really was. And he, he, I didn't even realize I hadn't mentioned him in the beginning, of course. But that goes to um, when you lose yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then peeling back the layers, like, yeah, it's, it is about me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's always about you. It's, exactly. it's always, it has always been about you. Right. What you think that you deserve and how you present yourself and all of the things. Mm hmm. So we'll do one more because I want to definitely respect your time. Mm -hmm. I'll let you pick the last one, my dear. Okay. Um, I like distrust or a lost faith in the masculine. Mm, that's yeah, interesting. I, right. I like that one. Why? Um, I'll tell you why. Because I feel like a lot of fatherless daughters are used to being raised and also being in environments with other strong Black women. And when you come from a single parent home, um, that is what the normal relationship dynamic is, your mm -hmm. mom and you, or another, you know, um, strong woman and yourself, your grandmother, your aunts, whoever it is. Right. And whenever you see that, and whenever that has been your experience most of your life, you do not understand or receive well masculine energy absolutely and so when it comes into your life like as forcefully as it can sometime you're like hold on <laughs> pause <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing? You know what I mean? Like, what? what is this? I don't like this. This is too strong. It's too forceful. Or what it said in terms of like you lose faith in it where you don't think that there is any good men out there. You don't mm. think that there's anyone who is operating the, the way you feel that men should. And of course, your your definition of what a man should look like is going to come from your imagination. Why? Because you have not seen a lot of it growing up. Exactly. It's going to come from what you saw on TV, what you read in books and things of that nature. And so a lot of it is, of course, made grandiose for entertainment purposes, because that's what TV, TV and books is for. Right. So you have this grandiose view of what something is supposed to look like and a person comes into your life and they don't meet that unrealistic expectation of something that you really have not witnessed on a real level where you can have realistic viewpoints about it. Then it's like when your view is here 
unrealistically so and somebody's coming here with you know what reality actually is all of this gap in between Ooh. that they're not fitting that they're not meeting is where we start to lose faith in the male species or in masculinity. Like he's not even, he didn't even come with, with flowers and a pony after we argued. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> where, where is my gl- pony? Where, where is my that? glass slipper? Okay. Like where is the, where is the limousine and where is the, the penthouse suite for our first date? Like that's what all the girls on TV get. Where is that at? Like all of these, you know, fairy tales and all of these movies, these romantic movies and things like that, they're entertaining. But a lot of us have internalized that to be like what we believe the relationship dynamic between a male and woman is supposed to look like. And if we haven't seen it in our homes in a real way, that's what we think is real. And so when that doesn't show up in our relationships with men, we lose faith because we're like, hey, like all of the things that I thought was supposed to happen hasn't happened. And now I'm disappointed that this regular schmegular guy is really just, you know, like here scratching his butt. And right. not like doing the things that I saw happening in, you know, The Little Mermaid or in a Pretty Woman or any of these other whim- uh, movies that we hold dear. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So that's that's how I look at that. And I, I think that it, it just goes back to us not really experiencing men um, in our formative years. And not mm. understanding, you know, how they show up in the different ways that they do and, you know, what it looks like when they are really excited or they're sad or they feel stressed. They feel like the weight of the world is on them, you know, like they feel tired or they're enraged or whatever it is. Like we haven't experienced that enough to be able to to understand that men are not a monolith and they also are not portrayed correctly on TV and in movies. And so it skews our view of what we should expect. And as a result of that, we lose faith when it doesn't show up the way we thought that it should. Wow, that's some deep stuff right there. So as you're talking, I hear the word romanticizing. Mm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. A lot of us like, I feel like if we're honest, a lot of women can remember at least one relationship with a really great guy that we ended or that went left because we romanticized what should have happened. And yes. really, this man was probably like a really great guy. And we were like, no, he's not doing what the movie said he should do, what the book said he should do and all of that. He's not a good guy. Mind you, this might've been the man who put a ring on it and showed you everything that you wanted to see, but because you were not used to what real men looked like and how they Mm -hmm. acted and what their personalities were like and stuff like that, you thought that this guy was not it because he did not do all of the grandiose things that you thought were normal that you saw on TV and in entertainment. And uh, it's like, you know, it's hard sometimes, it really is. Because there, there's there's nothing for us to really to look at. There's no litmus test that we have. Right. And so we're sitting up here trying to figure out for ourselves what that litmus test should be. And and the because, exactly. And because we are um, just a group of people who not only catastrophize things, but also live in extremes, we're expecting extremes as normal behavior when it's not. And that's where the problem lies. And then we'll wonder why he'll marry the next woman that he meets. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, okay. We have a comment. Let's see. Mm. Blind guy and his wife said, I stopped using strong and have replaced it with resourceful or resilient Oh, or magical Mm -hmm. or anything more empowering and definitive than just strong. I love that. I love the, the magical. Yeah. 
But I really like resourceful and resilient as well, because I yes. feel like that's even that speaks more to what um, the leader of my home needs mm. to be than than something else. I really like that. You want to I want a man who is resourceful and resilient, yes. you know, and I and I want a little magic um, sprinkled on that thing, too. So, yeah, I love that. <laughs> love that. What I love about the resourcefulness that equates to safety. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Emotional safety, physical safety, mentally mm -hmm. safe. Yeah. Yes. Like you know that they'll just be able to 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 take what is given to them and create the vision that they have. And you want that. You mm -hmm. want to be able to feel like if you come upon something hard that your man is not going to crumble under the weight of it. Exactly. You know? yeah. Oh. Well, Bernadette, as we come to a close, can you tell us any projects you have going on, any courses, um, events, anything? Mm -hmm. Plug, plug, yeah. plug. <laughs> Yeah, I can definitely do that. So the one thing that I am super excited about is that I wrote a journal. It's called Access Authenticity. Why didn't you send it to me? I could have put it on. the. Okay, put it closer. Put it closer. And everyone mm -hmm. watching, make sure to take a snap, a screenshot of it. Yeah. Where can they find Access. it? They can find it on Amazon. If you go on Amazon right now and you search Access Authenticity, you will see it come up. It's a um, a Journal Plus strategy guide, and it is 170 deep reflective questions to help survivors of trauma to go from their most authentic self being a secret identity to being one that they actually show and show up in. So I love it. Um, one of the things that I have come to understand about us is that we want to be deeply known. We want to be deeply seen, but a lot of us don't know how to get there. We don't have the roadmap. Mm. And so access authenticity is that roadmap. Not only does it answer, it allows you to answer questions, but it does also give you the strategy at the end so that you can then um, know exactly what to do with the answers to the questions that you um, that you wrote down. So I am super proud of this project. I was working on it for a few months and I really think that it's going to help so many people find out who their truest self is. Yes, I love that. You know, because we are, so, I'm looking up your info now so I can mm -hmm. drop the link we search for answers and I love that because you are providing a solution. Definitely. Definitely. All right. So everyone, the link, it's a long link. I don't have time to do the <laughs> short one. Yeah, it didn't go because it was too long. I am definitely going to put it in the show notes because mm. I want everyone to look at that and purchase it. But um, is it on your link tree as well? Yeah, it is. It's definitely on my link tree. Girl, let's get the link tree up in these comments section. <laughs> oh, that way they can experience everything. All right. Can you hold the book up again while I'm doing this? I want yeah, to definitely. what it looks like. There we go. All right. So there goes the link, and I'm still going to put it in the show notes as well. Bernadette, I didn't know you were doing that. Yeah, girl. You know, I'm over here just, you know, doing some different things. I want to make sure that the resources that I have for fatherless daughters are ones that they can really use. And the mm -hmm. more that I do this work, the more that I have um, sessions with one-on-one -on -one clients, the more that I'm able to to see like exactly what they need. And so I've just made it my mission to supply as many of those resources as I can. And a lot of it came from the fact that when I started on my own healing journey, I didn't find anything for me. There was one book and that book was my Bible for a long time, but there wasn't Ooh. anything else. And so it's like, you know what, that needs to change. And I've just been making sure that, you know, I can provide for them what I think is necessary that's really going to help them to get to the other side, which is mm -hmm. having aligned relationships, which is showing up as your most authentic self, yes. which is, you know, like healing and all of that and what it can look like. 
Exactly. Where were you all my life? <laughs> Trying to figure it out. <laughs> I was in the trenches with you for a long time. <laughs> we were in Armageddon together. Yes. <laughs> On different sides of the country. Definitely. Girl, continue to please do God's work. You're God's Thank angel. You. <laughs> you. Oh, oh yeah, Bernadette. Bernadette. Yeah. You're a black girl that still has her shift together. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to Black Girls Getting Their Shift Together. This was, you know what, Bernadette? I'm so invested in this topic because mm -hmm. it relates so much to me. I don't got to bump your episode up on my audio podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think I am for real. And <laughs> there's a, so many in queue. I'm going to have to bump yours up. Mm -hmm. Like for real. Yeah. Let me know when you do. I absolutely will. And I'll share everything with you. Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you so much again for tuning in to Black Girls Getting Their Shift Together. Make sure you like, comment, share this video. Do the audio. Make sure and go to Bernadette. Uh, all of her links that are, you can take a screenshot right now of her smart bio links. Purchase her her book, support black business, support black women, support yourself in this healing journey. That's what ultimately you want so that we can just keep everything internally. We're not going to have to look for extrinsic value in anyone. We have everything we need right here. I enjoy everybody. Thank you all so much and good night. <laughs> For the queen, sisters manifesting their dreams Get your cream by any means and being with self-esteem Beauty supreme and Buddha walk so mean The way you fit in them jeans, you eat your cornbread and greens Dance or a doctor, red wine or vodka Redesign your spot and redefine your mantra Retwist your locks and realign your chakras Doing your squats and getting closer to God, huh? Crunching with your squad or taking a girl's trip Adjust your crown, you guys give to the world, sis Celestial body, drink your water Meditate, sun kiss God is heavenly order Levitate, tribe of Ashanti, black girl magic, melanin popping, whether you ratchet or lavish, whether you bougie or savage, you a gift and a treasure, you got to love a black girl getting a shift together, black girls are getting a shift together.